Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, Galatians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to pick it up in verse 8 this week, and you might be able to hear, I still have remnants of this cold that I've had for a little while, and my throat never really has uh, totally healed. You can hear it in my voice still. So I don't have my 100% pure Bible voice today. Just a pure Bible study. We're going to pick it up, Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. It is uh, germane to what we're speaking about, and that is the weak and beggarly elements, which has to do with witchcraft, I believe, because Paul sets it up here in Galatians 3, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you received you the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith and so do we receive the spirit simply by believing the answer is yes we trust the lord with all of our heart lean not to our own understanding in all of our ways we acknowledge him and he directs our paths and so to to think that God can be initiated or God can be invoked to release his spirit upon us because we say certain words or we say them with a certain frame of mind or we perform certain rituals at certain times of the year, which is observing times. In other words, we're doing service to the stars, the moon, the sun, the heavenly luminaries. And he said by nature, these are not gods. He says, how be it then when you knew not God, you did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. You serve them by your worship of them. And you worship them because you are going to do what the stars tell you to do. What the sun in a certain position or the moon in a certain location or the stars and the planets being in a certain house, certain times of the year or whatever, whether it's the summer uh, solstice, the winter solstice or the spring equinox or the fall equinox. There are people who believe that they can observe certain times. And by doing that, they can then get greater blessings from God than they can at other times or they can reach God better than they can at other times of the year. And it's not true. We can access God by prayer, supplications, fasting. But by simple prayer, we can access God. Prayer is us asking God things. The Bible is God answering back what he's going to do. He's, God's going to follow his word. He is a man of his word. That's why I trust this Bible so much. And I don't even trust me, my feelings, my thoughts, my emotions. I trust only the written word of God. So they serve other gods by practicing the observing of times. Verse 9, but now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements? The word elements here. Fits. There's four places in your Bible where the word elements are used uh, here. And he talks about in in uh, second Peter, the elements going to be burnt up with a fervent heat. So the elements in Bible language are referring to the things of this world, the things of this universe, whether it's some sort of religious ritual, occult practice or it's astrology by serving the heavenly luminaries, whatever house Venus is in this week, well, I have to then do this according to astrology. And this is what I'm going to do. This, this is what my chart laid out I was going to do, which is divination. It's observing of times. And so he said, the weak and beggarly elements were until you desire again to be in bondage. So why would you go back? Why is it that before you had a religion where you had to perform and do and now that in Christ you can be set free from all of that, why go back again to serve the weak and beggarly elements? 
And then he said, you observe days, months, and times, and years. Four times the word element or elements is used in the King James. Four things here that they observe, days, months, times, and years, all has to do with time, the observance of time. Um, and four places where the Apostle Paul said, another gospel, another gospel, any other gospel, any other gospel. Four places where that. And all of this is a contradiction to what we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We know that Christ fulfills the times appointed of the Father. We know that Christ performed and fulfilled the finished work of the cross. So what is it that we have yet, that you and I have yet to perform, that if we perform them, God will then release himself or he'll release his spirit or God will release his powers to bring healing or to bring salvation or bring money or, or whatever it is. Why is it that some of these people have this idea that God is locked up in handcuffs and can't do anything until you release him by your faith-filled words? Why do people believe that? I don't know. But it's the same idea that says, if I observe certain days, then God's going to bless me more. If I follow certain months, if I follow times and years, and I'm, I'm, let me say this. Why is it that some people who study prophecy spend so much time trying to figure out the year of Christ's return, the month of Christ's return, the day of Christ's return? Why do all these people make all these predictions that never are true? And all you have to do is be wrong one time. And according to Deuteronomy 18, nobody has to listen to you ever again because you're a liar. And what is happening is all these people that are making all these predictions about when the Lord's going to return, when the rapture is going to happen, when a peace treaty is going to be signed with Israel for seven years, people making these predictions about when these things are going to start and they never turn out that way. People who made predictions back in 2012 about how the end of the world was going to be in 2012. It was going to start the tribulation. That never happened. How about 2013? People said, oh, we were a year off. 2013 is going to be the year. Didn't happen. 2014, comets go by. Meteors fly by the earth. People are looking at this and, oh, that's a sign and a wonder. It must be th this year. 2014 is the year that this is going to happen didn't happen 2015 same thing 2016 go through youtube if they haven't pulled the, if the people who put them up have not pulled these videos you'll find all of these predictions from last year the year before last and the year before last about how everything could just turn about to be the rapture at this certain time at this you know in, in this year it's going to happen this year in fact it would really surprise me if it didn't happen and i've heard them say that and anybody who makes a prediction of when the Lord is going to return is going to be proven to be a false prophet. All they have to do is be wrong one time. And when they get this wrong, then they boast, they still boast, and they still won't admit that they were wrong because then they start backing away from what they really said. Oh, I didn't really say that. But certainly some great important things have happened, right? What you said was that you'd be surprised if the Lord didn't come then. Well, he didn't come. So now you're a liar. And what happens is people fall into this and they end up being observers of times. All the feast days. Oh, you got to look at the feast days. The feast days is what God's going to do all of these things. Did you know that God himself told us, Jesus himself told us, no man, no man, knoweth the day nor the hour. And so there can be an observance of times by those who are promoting and those who are following certain ideas and calculations about certain Jewish feast days and Jewish holy days and 
make mathematical calculations and work it all out with a slide rule and we got a quantum computer working on it. It's going to predict the day of the Lord's coming. And it never happens. Don't fall for it, people. When God called me into studying prophecy, I went immediately into trying to figure out the day and the month and the year of the Lord's return. The day and the hour, the month, whatever. I wanted to figure, I wanted, it to, with me it was a pride thing. I wanted to be first in line. I wanted to pick a date and then announce it and then have everybody pat me on the back because I'm the one that figured it out. And God smote me. He kind of chastised me a little bit. He said, Mike, don't do it. Don't worry about the times appointed of the Father. God has them in his hand. There's a book in God's right hand, right? God has them in his hand. One of these days, he's going to give that to his son, Jesus. He's going to be worthy to unseal the book and to loose the things that are therein. And you and I do not know when that is going to happen. But God does. And I am content now and have been for a long time with God, whatever you're going to do and whenever you're going to do it, I trust you that you know the right time and you're going to do it the right way and you're going to do it in such a time that it's going to please and honor and glorify you. And so God, I am officially announcing I am out of the date setting business. I won't do it. So anyway, you observe days, months, times and years, four things. He said, I'm afraid of you, verse 11, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are, and ye have not injured me at all. Now, we had, we had talked about this, Romans 14, Acts 15, and so on, what we are to observe. Now, let's kind of look at the law and look at this thing of observing of times. Paul said it's the weak and beggarly elements. Because people are going to do this. They're going to think that they got it all figured out. They got the Bible and the calculations are just perfect. And it makes sense. And it's, it's going to happen by golly. Because I said it was going to happen. And I, my calculations are right. And it doesn't happen. And these people never apologize. Never do. They make these calculations and they make these guesses. And they insist that they're right. And when they're wrong, they don't apologize. They don't pull the YouTube video and say, I'm sorry, I should have never said that. Obviously, I was wrong. I don't know how I was wrong, but I'm not going to do that ever again. I'm going to leave that up to God. No, no, no. These same people are going to do it again. Do you know why? YouTube ad revenue. They want a million hits on their video because YouTube's going to pay them the advertising money that YouTube got from them, from their video. And they're going to make these wild, these wild um, prognostications. And people are going to fall for it. And this guy's going to make a ton of money on a lie. And I won't do it. I refuse. So let's look at what God told us not to do. Let's go to Leviticus 19, verse 26. God said, you shall not eat anything with the blood. That was one of the rules that we covered last week that the apostles and the elders laid down for us in the Gentile age that we're not to eat anything with blood in it, we're not to eat anything that's strangled, but not to eat anything sacrificed to idols and we're to abstain from fornication. Four things here for us Gentiles who have received the gospel. And right here, he said in Leviticus 19, 26, you shall not eat anything with the blood. Neither shall you use enchantment nor observe times. Observe times. What times? Any of them. Time-based rituals like the summer solstice ritual that these people, these pagans perform at um, Stonehenge every year in the summer solstice. They gather around with the white robes, the druids, and they do all these weird things. And the sun rises up on, on uh, June 21st and shines through a, a certain thing that they've got cut into the rock 
on exactly that date, the sun is shining into whatever used to be there. Nobody knows. There's tombs, ancient tombs that were built so that on certain days, the sun would shine right into that tomb. Supposedly, that was going to raise that guy back to life. Okay. And uh, all of this, I think, observing of times does not lead you to Christ. It leads you to anti Christ. Okay. Nor observe times. You shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. Now, why did he say that? I'm not sure. But then look at verse 28. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead. Right? The priest of Baal cut themselves in the days of Elijah when they couldn't get Baal to wake up and send fire down from heaven. So they began to cut themselves and slash themselves and blood was dripping all over the place. And they're trying to get Baal's attention. It's not working. So God told his people, you should not cut your flesh for the dead. Then he said, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Now, what I see in this world is a lot of people getting tattoos. And I mean, a lot of them, both men and women, used to be in the old days, only old sailors and old soldiers had, sometimes they had these handmade tattoos put on. Okay? They had it on their arm, right up here or right here. Okay? My dad made some kind of little deal right here on his hand. That was it. That's all that he had. Okay? And he, him and a buddy did it himself. I think they were teenagers. But anyway, now we live in a world where everybody is printing marks upon their skin. Now, there are some that would say, but this is for Jesus because I put Jesus things on me. I, I tattooed myself with pictures of Jesus and his name written down and the triketras and the cross. And God did not say, do not print bad marks on your skin. He said, nor print any marks upon you. And it's curious to me that he used the word mark. Do not print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Four words. So, the word mark being here. I'm not sure what it exactly means. But, I'm convinced that as we roll on into the future, I believe that we are going to see something pretty close to the Lord's return and we're going to say that's it right there folks let me encourage you I've preached against getting tattoos and some of the people that I've preached it to went out and got tattoos I don't expect anybody to change anything in their life because of anything that I said because if I tell you God wants you to do this. Somebody else can come along and say, no, God doesn't want you to do this. He wants you to do that and you'll do it. So I don't want to demand that nobody get any tattoos from here to eternity. I'm going to encourage you to read your Bible as it is written and believe it as it is written and obey it as it is written. Because he included the observance of times and enchantments and eating things with blood along with printing any marks upon you. He equated it with that. He also said, don't put, uh, let's see here. You should not make any, uh, you should not round the corners of your beards, nor shall thou mar the corners uh, of your heads. I don't quite understand what that means. Okay. I hope it's, I hope I'm fine. I hope I'm good. But anyway, the main thing here is, do not observe times. God said so. Now, Deuteronomy 18. There's a list of nine forbidden practices. God said, don't do them. And he was serious about it. God said, if I catch anybody doing these, then I'm going to cut you off from the people of Israel. Meaning, I'm going to separate you out and I'm going to have you killed. I'm serious. I do not want these religious practices amongst my people. Do you know what the Jews right now do? these 
They call it Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. But at the end of the day, it has to do with these things that God said, don't, don't do what the heathen are doing. Let's look at it. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Now, those nations, in, from what I can see in Scripture, were ruled over by giants and according to the witness of the spies that came back from Canaan land, Numbers 13, they said, the people over there is great and tall, the sons of Anakim. It's like practically everybody there is a giant. And these giant kings, these giant rulers over the people of Canaan, instituted religious practices based upon worshiping Baal and Ashtaroth, the masculine and feminine deity, together, uh, unionizing them together. In other words, putting the yin and the yang together. All right. And they had all these practices that went along with it. So when thou art coming to the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination to those nations. Verse 10, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. That's what Manasseh did. Or that useth divination. Or an observer of times. Uh, you could say it's an astrologer. Uh, and, and that would fit there. But anybody who has the doctrinal idea that says there are certain days where God makes himself closer to his people than others, don't believe it. Don't fall for it. Don't buy into it. You can try it out if you want. And if God loves you, God will let you know somehow, some way, that the certain day that you picked has no real significance and impact with God. And God's either going to bless you or he's not going to bless you because of who he is and who you are and how God's relationship is with you. And it doesn't have anything to do with you picked a certain day to perform a ritual to God thinking that you were going to get some great thing out of God because you picked a certain day to do it. You observed a time. Jim Staley, head of one of the Hebrew Roots churches in this area, where he used to be, said, I believe that when we observe times, and he used that exact phrase, I believe that when we observe times on Yahweh's calendar, great things are done for us or something like that. But he admitted that he was an observer of times. Probably in the form of the feast days. And the Hebrew roots people are big on that. While they curse us Gentile Greek pagans of having Easter and Christmas and, and blast us for that, they themselves participate in a Passover Seder, which is nothing but Jewish mysticism rolled into Passover practices. Most of what you see at a Jewish Seder does not qualify as a Passover uh, observance. Doesn't even come close. The empty plate and the empty chair at the table, where's that in the Bible? The fact that they're all sitting around the table goes against what God told Moses and the Israelites to do. When you had the Passover feast, stand. Don't sit down. Stand with your coat on, your staff in your hand, ready to go. Because I'm going to release you. That night, I'm going to set you free at that Passover. And they don't even do that. So they observe times. But even at that, they don't do it the way the Bible prescribes. They do it the way the Jewish rabbi mystics told them to do it. Okay? And these mystics used enchantments. These mystics used divination and getting in contact with the dead. Jewish rabbis going to the graves of certain famous Kabbalistic rabbis, hoping to get a release of that ancient rabbi's anointing and have his that rabbi's spirit enter into them so they could be a great rabbi and understand the mysteries of the Kabbalah. That's necromancy. Okay, let me, let me keep reading here. Uh, use a divination or observer of times or an enchanter or a witch. See the connection? Witch and observer of times. Witches observe times. Witches have 
high holy days. They have cross quarter days. And they observe those days in the thought that an observance of times along with facing the four cardinal directions, there's a number, and invoking the four elements, which they believe that there are watchtower spirits over each one of these elements. And in those watchtower spirits, there's a dragon. Imagine that. They're following the religious practice given to them by their God, the dragon, Satan himself. So witchcraft or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. Necros is a Greek word for dead or death. Necromancy is magic or uh, religious rituals performed by the power of dead people. And remember what Jesus said. God's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Okay. So the rabbis were, many of them, necromancers because they would go to the graves of these ancient rabbis and call forth their spirit so that their spirit would be in them so they would understand the great mysteries of the Kabbalah. It's necromancy. And they taught observance, of a strict observance of times. You don't miss these dates. You don't fall away from them. You have to do exactly what we tell you to do because we believe that the world to come that is promised to us by God or Yahuwah is done by works, not by simple faith. That is an almost direct quote from a Jewish rabbi in a video somebody sent me. God says in verse 12, For all the, that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations without which thou shalt possess hearken unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. God said, don't observe times. And if he said, don't do it, it doesn't mean that you can still do it. God said, don't do it. And Paul, here, here's the Old Testament version of it. Now we have a second witness in the New Testament. Paul said, ye, um, ye observe days and months and times and years. You follow a strict enforcement of ritualistic meetings that must be held on certain high Holy days, because everybody knows that God favors these days and he blesses us more on these days than he does other days. I don't believe that. The greatest things that God has ever given me, my wife, my children, all of my grandchildren, this ministry that God has entrusted me with, the, the, the knowledge that my Bible is inerrant, and my salvation. Did you know that I was saved in the summer, but I wasn't saved at the summer solstice? What gives? I didn't wait for June 21st when I was nine years old to be saved. Because I thought maybe I'll get saved better if I wait till that day. I just did it when God called me. The greatest things that God has ever done and ever given to me has been without me thinking that I had to observe certain days in order to get them. Fact of the matter is, whenever God's ready to show me something from the Bible, He shows it to me. Whenever God's ready to enlighten your mind about Scripture and about your life, He just does it for you. He just gives it out of the blue. You're going, oh, wow. Where's my Bible? And you start searching through scripture. You're looking, you're using the software and you're going, man, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Look at what God has shown me. I wonder what the calendar is. The calendar just says it was uh, August 5th. No big deal. Who cares, right? So he says, don't observe times. He said, God doesn't suffer or allow you to do those things. So don't do them. Second Chronicles 33, this is Manasseh. And I've been, uh, still haven't finished that series uh, on Manasseh and his, his pyramid building scheme, his pyramid scheme, where he adds 13 layers. And then the 14th is he puts an idol in the house of God. No other king had dared do that one. 
But Manasseh made an image of some false god and set it in the most holy place in the, in the temple. I ain't got the nerve. I, I just, no way. There's no way I would do that. I wouldn't even draw a picture of it. Okay? But Manasseh did it. And look at what he was. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem, but did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Now I'm going to read this and I'm going to tell you where I'm going with it. Where I'm going with it is, is that I believe that these things that Paul mentioned here, the weak and beggarly elements, the observance of days, months, times, and years, I believe that these things when done, are not going to lead to Christ. They're going to lead people to the revelation of the Antichrist. But they're going to accept him as Christ. They're going to be deceived. That is that great deception, strong delusion that God is going to pour out in the last days. And that delusion is going to be so powerful and so strong that if you're not truly elect and truly born again, you're going to fall for it. And I believe that it's going to be done in accordance with ancient witchcraft rituals of observance of times. Okay? That's what I believe. So, when Manasseh was doing these things, it caused him to put an idol in the house of God. When God tells us not to do that, it's because God knows that where it's going to lead to is us allowing and placing the man of sin, the son of perdition, in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And the temple of God is this body. And it's going to be done by way of these things that Manasseh did. He built again the high places, which Hezekiah's father had broken down. He reared up altars for Balaam and made groves and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. Worship is serving. Okay. Also, he built altars in the house of the Lord, where the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. This, that's so wicked and evil. To have your mind so, your conscience so seared with a hot iron that you believe that it is a moral and righteous thing to toss your children onto a burning altar and pass your children through the fire. So that the God, Molech, can be satisfied with your sacrifice. That is so wicked. Um, then he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he said, a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. So here's warnings from God. God shows us by way of Manasseh. If you start doing these things, even if you start doing them in a church, because they are, they're doing these things. They're using divination at the Bethel Church in Redding, California. Bill Johnson, there's a woman that's on staff at that church, a minister on staff that has a Christian form of tarot cards. Uh, what is your date of birth? How old are you? How many times you've been married? How many kids do you have? Okay. Takes all those numbers and works it out. And she lays out these cards, these divination cards with certain Psalms written. I guarantee you they're not King James. Certain Psalms written on there. And that tells his past, his present, and his future. And it's divination being done in a church. And I think that these practices are leading people to the day when they're going to rear up a standing image in the temple of God. The body. Literally. The human body. All right? God said, don't do it. He tells us. He warns us through Manasseh, through the law. Don't do it. If you do, I'm going to have to kill you. Because I cannot allow this to continue. But in the last days, God's going to allow it. Because what is going to happen, it's going to divide who is on God's side, who's on the devil's side. Right now, it may be hard for you to discern maybe some of your family members that you hope are saved, but you see a lot of things out of their church that ain't right. And you pray for them all the time. Right now, we're not sure who is and who isn't. 
there's coming a day when it's going to be very obvious. Okay? Isaiah chapter 1, turn there. Look at what God said to his people Israel. Verse 13. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. New moons, Sabbaths, calling of assemblies, solemn meeting. Right there. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, that sounds like that praise and worship deal. Yes, I'm living in sin with my girlfriend and we have beer parties every Friday and Saturday night when we have our friends over. But on Sunday, we worship God like this. Right? God says, I'm weary to bear them. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together. Saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And concerning observance of times, he mentioned your new moons, your appointed feasts, your Sabbaths, your calling of assemblies. I hate them. I hate every one of them. Why? They were performing the ritual, but it lacked the most important ingredient. And that is faith. They were performing probably paganized forms of feast days, doing it on God's, the feast days that God gave them. But they were doing paganized forms of it and they did not believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had already migrated over to a new God. And God says, I see what you're doing in church every time, every Sunday, every Saturday. And God said, I'm sick of it. I loathe it. It means nothing to me. You think because you met on a certain day and had a certain feast that I, that I have to show up simply because you did this? Well, you're wrong. I will not show up in the midst of an unregenerated people. I will not show up in the midst of a willfully sinful people who have no concept of who I am and how I work, but they are worshiping Baal. And God says, I'm not, I'm not going to have any part of it. Hosea chapter 2, verse 10. And now will I discover her lewdness. In the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver out her out of mine hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. Her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. There it is again. See, it's contradictory to the gospel. How about instead of us fulfilling these feast days, how about we let Jesus fulfill them? Because he's the only one actually qualified to do it. Because he's clean and holy and undefiled. And whenever we practice some sort of observance of times, even if it comes straight out of the Bible, we're unclean and undone and can't do it. So why don't we let God do it? Only let Christ and trust the finished work of the cross at Passover. I mean, who did that? Who fulfilled that Passover? Was it the disciples? Was it Rome? Was it Caesar? Was it Pontius Pilate? Was it the Sanhedrin? No. It was Jesus who did that. He's the one that did it. Uh, verse 12. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, wherefore she hath said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me, and I will make them a forest, and the beast of the field shall eat them, and I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers, and forgat me, saith the Lord. And I just, I see in churches, they perform the rituals. They follow the order of the sacred holy service, the divine service. But they forgot God. 
and how is God's presence to be gauged inside any church? Do they believe this or not? Okay, that's how you, that's how you can discern whether or not the Holy Ghost is going to show up in a church. What is their ideas concerning God's word? Oh, it's full of mistakes. King James, especially full of errors, full. Of, we just don't even use it anymore. We use the the message Bible. That's that's a good Bible. People don't understand that. God said, you forgot all about me. Uh, Colossians 2, 13. He, Paul said, you being dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. I love it. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. People, the Hebrew roots in the days of social media are going to come out full force against anybody who dares to say, I am a Bible believing Christian. I believe in the new covenant, not the renewed covenant of Mount Sinai. And I believe that as a Gentile follower and believer, I believe that Jesus is the one who has fulfilled his times and his seasons. There's no way that I can do it justice. And so, uh, let no man judge you. Here's what these people will do. They will build up false sins. False sins. They'll say, you didn't keep Passover, did you? No, you didn't go to Passover Seder. You didn't keep Feast of Tabernacles, did you? No, you didn't do that. You didn't keep Pentecost, did you? No, you didn't have that feast. And they build up all these fake and phony sins that they invented. They lay them on you and say, you're guilty. Therefore, you're not going to heaven like I'm going to heaven. And Paul said, don't let anybody judge you. Especially when it comes to meat or drink, respect of a holy day or a new moon or the Sabbath day. And he said, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Man, I, I, I just had some, my mind wondered, had some thoughts there, and I'm going to have to work on it because it was pretty good. Can't really tell you because it's not, it's not soup yet, all right? These feast days from the Old Testament, all they are is a shadow of things to come. They're not the real thing. They're only the shadow of the real. I would rather wait until Jesus comes. And as his body, whatever Jesus observes, we observe. It's that simple. Isaiah 47, turn there. Isaiah 47, and we'll close with this. Verse 13, thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers and the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators. You know what these guys were? Observers of times. Astrology, stargazers, prognosticators, monthly ones. Meaning that they used the motions of, and the positions of the heavenly lights, whether it's the sun, the moon, the planets, or any of the stars, they use their position to predict something that was going to happen in your life, or their life, or this country, or whatever. And there's a good chance that in some of it, they were actually right, which gives people the idea. I, I know that they kind of missed it on this one, but there was three things that he said. I mean, it just happened exactly the way he said it. I'm, man, I'm a believer. But the truth of it is, if he's wrong one time, you don't have to believe him. God has a high standard. God is never 
wrong. And he's never going to be wrong. Ever. So why be an astrologer? Why worry about Jupiter being in the house of Venus? And I've seen, I've seen observance of times. I've seen time charts for the Lord's return where people based it upon the position of some planet or some star in Virgo uh, or it's next to Venus or Venus is in so-and-so's house or whatever. They do it based upon astrology. I, I wouldn't do it if I were you. He tells you not to do it. So is it okay if you do it as long as you say, it's Jesus, is it okay to do yoga and get into this mindless, mindless, uh, your, your mind is a big void vacuum. You've emptied your mind of every thought. Is it okay to do that and yoke yourself in with a God as long as you believe that that God is Jesus? No, it's not. God doesn't care what names you stick on it. If God said don't do it, he meant don't do it. So he said, let now the astrologers and the stargazers and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. You know what God's going to do? God's going to make the astrologers and the stargazers and the monthly prognosticators, he's going to make every one of them wrong. God's going to trick them. He's going to fool them. He's going to send a lying spirit to feed them false information. And they're going to pass that along to everybody. And everybody's going to be set up for a certain day. And it was a setup. God's going to make them out to be a liar. But the world's going to follow them. So in verse 14, behold, there shall be a stubble. The fire shall burn them and they shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at nor fire to sit before it. Thus shall they be unto thee with whom thou hast labored, even thy merchants from thy youth. They shall wander every one to his quarter. None shall save thee. Observing days, months, times, and years, even those four things, it's four of the wrong things. Another gospel in any other gospel is not the gospel. It's not. And God's going to let all of these people be wrong. And yet billions of people are going to follow them anyway. And so are a lot of church people who are going to be taught that observing days and months and times and years is what God really wants us to do, even though he said, here, don't do that. In, you know, even though Paul said here that I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul labored amongst these people, and then he left, and then he finds out that they're following Jewish feast days. They've all been convinced they have to be circumcised in order to go to heaven, and they've all been told that they have to keep the law of Moses in order to truly be saved. And Paul said, I'm, I'm scared to death that in writing you this letter, you're going to be so mad at me that you're going to bust out and leave and form your own church. And all my labor among you is going to be in vain. I know that feeling. I know that feeling. So is there a certain appointed time that the father has for sending his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth? I believe so. I just don't know exactly when it is. And since I don't know, why should I then observe a time or try to tell everybody else that they should observe a time when the truth is we don't know if it's the time or not? We have no idea. But plainly put, God said, don't fall for it. Now, this comes in many different forms. And what, what I'm telling you is in your life, there may come a situation, and I can't sit and pick out every single one of them, but in your life, there may have already been or will come a situation whereby someone will tell you, hey, we're having an observance here, a Yeshua, Yahuwah observance at our synagogue, our Jewish Messianic synagogue, and we want to invite you to come over and be part of that, and you can receive Yahuwah's blessings. Don't do it. 
because they're over there observing times thinking that by keeping the law God is going to bless them more and Paul called it they're trying to bewitch you so that you could go back to following the law instead of living by faith and allowing God's grace to work in your life okay I'm just teaching you the basic principles of the Bible that says don't do it you decide when the time comes I believe that you're going to see it Holy Ghost is going to remind you of these scriptures and you're going to say you know what I can't go to that and now instead of this guy inviting you you're going to invite him by way of the word of God out of that mess into the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ found in his word okay so watch and be ye ready because his coming it could be any day so let's just believe that and believe when we get up in the morning Lord is this the day could this be the day even so come quickly Lord Jesus just go about your day and your business live it for the Lord to the fullest and let God worry about what feast day or what day period that he's going to send his son back to call us forth to be part of his body all right God bless you pray for us pray for me pray for my throat I mean it's you know my throat my mouth that you know is the biggest part of this ministry so pray that God gives me my voice back all right I love you God bless you we'll see you next time bye-bye